Cognitive load theory is founded on the idea that we can only think about and process so much information at once. Now that thinking happens in our working memory. And what we know about working memory is we can only think about five to nine chunks of information at any one point in time. Now, this is important because working memory is the gateway to learning. That's how we get information into our long-term memory. So cognitive load theory suggests that any form of instruction or any form of teaching actually places demands on our working memory. Now, this is important for educators because we don't want to cognitively overload our students. So cognitive load theory suggests that there are three different types of cognitive load. The first one is intrinsic load, which is the inherent complexity of the information. If I ask you to add something or I ask you to perform some algebra, those have different levels of complexity. The second one is extraneous cognitive load. That's the additional more, the extra images, the extra information, the extra detail that isn't central to learning. It's not part of that essential concept. So it's not really necessary for learning and can, in fact, impair learning. The last one is germane cognitive load. And that's the load associated with the processes, the thinking processes that we engage in when we're learning. It can be organizing information. It can be interpreting information. But those processes that we engage in for learning are also placing demands on our working memory. Working memory is our gateway for learning. So what we do with that information in working memory is important. The amount of time we process information and how we process that information. But we can't see our working memory, which means we can't see when stuff is spilling out, when we're becoming cognitively overloaded. So what's important is that we design educational experiences and instruction that minimizes that risk of cognitively overloading our students. So how do we minimize the load we place on learners? So let's use the example of a human heart. And let's say we're trying to learn about how blood flows through the heart. So if we look at an image, this image, for example, what we see is it's very anatomically correct. It's what you'd see in a lot of medical and science sorts of textbooks. Now, the way that they design these images is that they are anatomically correct, and they label different parts, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then in the text below, they'll often describe that process of blood flow through the heart, and they'll put those numbers in there. Number one, that's, this is what part number one is. Number two, this is what part number two is. What we find, though, is that this is actually quite cognitively demanding for a number of reasons. The first one is it has a high extraneous load. There's a lot of detail in that image that isn't central for learning. There's a lot of tendons. There's a lot of anatomical detail that if what you're trying to gain is a basic understanding of blood flow through the heart, it really isn't going to help you. It's more distracting information. Also, it splits your attention. So you need to look at number one and then go down to the text. Well, this is how blood's flowing and there's what number one is. Okay, back to the image, back to the text, back to the image. So we're shifting our attention back and forth, which is also a cognitively demanding process. It's also intrinsically complex. So the explanation that we have below is actually quite demanding as well. There's a lot of detail that we don't need. There's a lot of jargon that perhaps we could get around. So there's extra demand associated with the complexity of the information too. What this means is that we have less space in our working memory for those learning processes, the germane cognitive load, those things that we need to engage in to learn the material well. An alternative might look something like this. Sure, it's not as anatomically correct, but it has all of those essential features that you need to be able to understand blood flow through the heart. So we've taken out a lot of that extraneous detail that isn't essential for learning about blood flow. In addition, we see that the names and numbers are actually together in the text with the description. So rather than having to shift your attention from number one to the text to figure out what number one is and how that fits back to number two, you can actually follow along in the diagram because the text is embedded there. What we've done is we've decreased the extraneous load that this diagram places on the learner's working memory. The intrinsic load is decreased as well. 
the actual explanation of blood flow takes out some of the unnecessary jargon. It takes out some of the unnecessary detail and sticks to just the essentials in terms of the basics of blood flow through the heart. Because we've decreased these two sources of cognitive load, there's less extraneous load, there's less intrinsic load, that frees up more space in working memory for the learner to engage those learning relevant processes. The intrinsic load and extraneous load are additive. They add together. So a higher intrinsic load, a higher extraneous load runs the risk of cognitively overloading our students. In that first diagram, we saw a high intrinsic load. The level of complexity of the explanation was actually quite high. There was also a lot of detail. There was some redundant information. There was some additional unnecessary information. There were details we didn't need. The extraneous load is also quite high. With both of those being high, we run the risk of overloading our students. In that second example, we've reduced both the intrinsic and extraneous load. The complexity of the description has been reduced. We've taken down the redundant information. We've eliminated the need to split your attention and shift it back and forth between the image and the text. And that frees up space in our working memory for those germane cognitive processes, the processes that we need to engage in to learn.